Hi everyone, my name is Živa Kleindienst and together with today Vindish, Peter Tomáš Dobrila and Alexandra Kostic, I am one of the curators of the International Festival of Art, Technology and Science, Kiblix 2020, entitled Virtual Worlds Now. I welcome you on behalf of Kibla, who has been organizing this festival since 2002. With the new long-term focus of Kibla on XR technologies and art in scope of RUC, Network of Art and Cultural Research Centers, and considering that 2020 has probably been the most virtual year we have lived so far, the key question we are asking for this year's festival is what are the virtual worlds now? Today we will start with our series of panel discussions, each with a special conceptual focus corresponding to the festival's main topic. Here, I would like to announce our first panel discussions today, which is entitled Digital Intimacy in Virtual Worlds Now. I would like to welcome all of our guest speakers and moderator, Gillian Boddington, who is the co-founder and creative director of East London Interactive Design Collective, Body Data Space and Digital Intimacy Expert. For Q&A, I welcome everyone to use the chat on the right side of the screen where you can post your comments and questions, which will be read by the moderator on your behalf. Gilan, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first panel as part of the Kiblex Festival. Thank you very much for a good introduction, Jiva. So digital intimacy in virtual worlds now. We're bringing together a, a set of people working very clearly from different angles at the concept of digital intimacy within our digital new media framework. As we all know, we're in a very unprecedented time. This near universal shift to virtual presence that we're all caught in as we end up in Zoom and MST and various other platforms every day with our work, our social life and our play communicating with each other in a way which we've done a bit before, but never at this level. So cutting edge ideas around this evolutions that have been happening all around us. We're seeing hybrid and hybrid virtual physical scenarios happening to create community, to create connectivity and intimacy. And we're going to hear about some of the conceptual directions and outputs that this set of wonderful people have enabled and which they are using to reflect on our human need for intimacy and belonging. The virtual opposite to the social distancing that many of us are caught in every day at the moment. We hope to hear both about their present work now and later in this um, in this um, panel to talk about the future of virtual physical hybrid environments and to give us some commentary on the future of belonging and bonding where potentially our virtual physical bodies come together and we're using both of them well into a world where we can make good connections. So I'm Ghislaine Boddington, I'm the Creative Director of Body Data Space and a lot of my work across the last 30 years has been in this area of digital intimacy. I'll be showing you a few slides later in the in the um, panel. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to introduce this amazing group of people around me and we will then go into some presentations from each of the groups as groups as groups as well as individuals here. And I will do a little bit of discussion with you with them. I will receive some of your questions through the chat room, which will be facilitated to me. And then at the end of the whole session, we will go to a full discussion and take more of your chats and comments. So I have with me here now Mark Jeffrey, maybe to do a hand wave, Mark, who actually I have known Mark for a long time. We've known each other since probably the early 90s. Yeah. When Mark actually who is British, but living in Chicago for the last, what, 15 years or more? Long time. Yeah. And um, next. Judd Morrissey, who is also in Chicago, and um, we've got to know each other the last 10 years or so. And Mark and Judd have been doing some amazing work together with another collaborator, Ab Abraham Abandon. Oh, I've said your name wrong. You're going to have to open your mic and say your name for me. Thank you. Avnasan. Ab it's a tough one. Avnasan. And Abraham, you're in Cleveland at the moment. Yeah. Fantastic. So, there's three of you in the US and actually also Sly Lee, who is our final speaker tonight. There's Sly at the, there. 
he will be um, he is joining us from Los Angeles. So I know you're all in very different time frame from me and Valerie. And Valerie actually is in Slovenia and she's in Ljubljana. <laughs> and I'm in London. So we've got a good mixture, European and US coming together here. And the time and distance gaps between us all are quite obvious. Yeah. Early morning, I think, for you in L.A., Sly. So thank you for being with us early and also pretty early for you lot in Chicago, too. And uh, Valerie, we're about an hour apart. Yeah. But the, we've all got time and distance between us. And here we are joining into Together to Talk in this panel and sharing that with you all on the on the Kiblitz website and also on the Facebook. So, so first of all, I'm going to ask Mark and Judd and Abraham to share with us some very special work that they have been evolving, which I believe, and I'm going to be checking this out later as well, has pretty much evolved during lockdown, yeah? So, can I hand over to Mark, Judd and Abraham? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ghislaine. It's great to see you and it's it's great to be here and thank you to everyone. Um, I'm going to do screen sharing, so hopefully this will be a smooth transition. Um, we have um, a largely um, scripted talk that is about, um, I think, eight or nine minutes, and then we have a, a few minutes of video material. Now, I, um, sorry. I want to just, oh, there you all are, perfect. I'm situated and I'm ready to go. Um, so um, thank you again to um, Ghislaine, Tade, Jiva and the Kiblix Festival and, and to um, the other presenters as well. We are Adam R and Abraham Avnison. And we're doing this um, sort of site-specific talk for the festival um, called The Tenders, an Original Mixed Reality Cover Song. Site one, Adam R. Anatomical Theaters of Mixed Reality, Adam R. is a performance and technology collective exploring 21st century embodiment. Adam R. was conceived in response to the historical architecture of early modern anatomical theaters. These are spaces designed for viewing human dissections and early surgical procedures. This historic space of operations, illustrating the interpenetration of anatomy and technology, is evoked symbolically in our work in order to engage with queer histories and narratives of the body, sexuality, and prosthesis. The trauma, upheaval, and also the spatial constraints of the pandemic comprise another interruption through which our work has transformed into something both recognizable and strange, a new uncanny that we inhabit in intimately connected solitude. Today, we will speak briefly about some of the sites and histories informing our latest work the Tenders, a mixed reality performance um, or an original mixed reality cover song um, that juxtaposes the figure of the American cowboy with the settler colonial origins of the city of Chicago, among many other entanglements of research, influence, inspiration, and language. Site two, Tender Embrasures. We begin with the word embrasure, an opening or dilation within architecture, anatomy, or space. In this slide, we see Mark reaching his arm through the embrasure of a colonial fort used for surveillance and the prosthesis of weaponry. A word that sounds like embrace, this is one of the gaps of entangled intimacy and violence through which we are apprehending the work as it is constructed. The embrasure and more generally colonial military forts need to be understood as early technologies of seeing essential to the settler colonial project. In the tenders, 
Embrasures are placed in relation to both windows as domestic apertures and in relation to 3D scanning technologies, including LIDAR and photogrammetry. Photorealistic on the one hand, yet ethereal and otherworldly on the other, we use 3D scanning in the work to develop an aesthetic of haunting through which to uncover erased and suppressed histories Using the technology's official blind spots, these circular voids, which the scanner cannot access, which you can see in this slide, as wormholes through which to teleport our bodies. <clears throat> Site three, beautiful, holy, jewel home. This site is the pre-pandemic origin of our current work, the bedazzled home of the American self-taught artist, Loy Bowen, who cultivated a persona, the original rhinestone cowboy, inspired by Glenn Campbell's 1975 song, Rhinestone Cowboy. Loy Bowen bedazzled the interior of his home, his clothing, his teeth, and his car, creating a dazzling camouflage in which body and space are layered and co-extensive. We thought of the work as a multi-layered garment and were concerned with the queering of the cowboy, the excessive ornamentation of nudie suits, and the paradox of Boland's originality. Bolin's house was collected as an artwork by the Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, and they agreed to let us scan the house with a LIDAR scanner. Site four, the fort. While developing our new work, we were invited, this is still pre-pandemic, as artists in residence to the Bridge House Museum in Chicago to develop our Loy Bolin inspired project. But upon arrival, we immediately became aware that we were standing within the footprint of the former Fort Dearborn, a colonial era garrison integral to the seizure of native lands and the incorporation of the city by white settlers. Here, we see a bas relief called Defense, which depicts the colonial theft of land that became Chicago unequivocally as a legitimate response to Native American aggression. Across the river from the bridge's uh, tender house is the Trump Tower Hotel, Chicago, with its invasive, tastelessly oversized letters. Through this viewpoint, we understood that the ghostly presence of the fort as a symbol of racial inequity, or put more bluntly, white supremacy, still remains and persists in the xenophobic and racist rhetoric and policies of the now outgoing US president. In our collaborative pieces, we often work with two narratives that are juxtaposed. The narrative of the fort began to merge with that of the home. And this in turn reconfigured the role of the cowboy as a figure in the theater of settler colonialism. In turn, the cover song began to refer to the covering over of underrepresented historical narratives and the repetition of dominant origin stories of colonialism. What we are looking at are LIDAR scans of the footprint of the former Fort Dearborn and the surrounding area in downtown Chicago. Site five, homing. During the first lockdown, although I've never actually come out of <laughs> the first lockdown, uh, we translated our site-based practice into our domestic spaces. We bought wireless headsets and green screen materials of all kinds, merging our language of embodied augmented reality and virtual environments with the vernacular and affordances of video conferencing platforms. We turned our practice inside out, bringing the sites we had collected through video and 3D scannings 
inside our networked home theatres. That, uh, sorry, into our domestic architectures, interweaving these spaces with our bodies, inverting and subverting hauntings of space to explore new ways of texturing and layering, navigating through voids in the data towards the other side of the pandemic as a site to come. Site six, cruising ground. While navigating the online um, gay hookup site, manhunt.net, my location was automatically identified as being Fort Dearborn Edition, Illinois. While incorrect in regards to where I live in Chicago, it turns out that such a place name can be used to describe a portion of the downtown area here known as the Loop, pointing to the recursive power of the fort to reproduce itself even after its stolen land is sold and parceled off to private developers. What does it mean that the fort's disappearance is also its addition? What does it mean that I am inside this addition and part of its count? Why is this addition a space of desire? How does desire hold me here? And what can I do about the way I'm being held? How can I be not just counted, but accountable? An embrasure, incidentally, I discovered just this morning, also has this definition, an opening through which missiles may be discharged. One evening, recently, I wandered through a cruising ground, neutralized by the COVID pandemic, a bird watching zone that also contains the history of being a Cold War missile site. Days later, we recorded our DIY original cover song, abstracting Glenn Campbell's Rhinestone Cowboy and laying a sung poem over the top. We will now play a short excerpt from our original mixed reality cover song. I'm gonna be where the loads are tender in Riding out Tender on a horse In a star-spangled rodeo Getting cards and letters Missiles become missiles from submissives who we don't even know. I don't really in this cold mind of cruising ground. There's a smile where I miss We can hide all the pain. Buried in the secrets of your rising. Put you down, put you down, but you're down when you're riding the train. The 
Put your down are riding the train is taking the long a way hard down. So many sexy soldier boys in the forest below, dear one, addition. So many loads, so many loads of compromising, tenderizing my horizon, but I'm gonna be where the lights are shining down on me, I'm gonna be where the lights Like a dazzling camel, like a sapper, like a sapper, like a soldier stationed in a fort somewhere, like a sapper, like a sapper, like the song of erosion in the throat of a gold shield, riding out. Star-spangled rodeo. Believe I studied rodeo. We can't hear you. Thank you very much for sharing with us then. Um, that was very special and thank you for doing it in such a performative way. So actually, maybe I'm going to start with that point just to ask you a few questions and comments. Um, I know that uh, Mark and Judd and Abraham, I'm not saying well, know so well, but are coming from a performance and live art background and you've been performing mainly, your work would be shown in live scenarios in the theatre, et cetera, or in wherever, site specifically in different ways. So, so in this work where you've had to very interestingly shift from a halfway through preparing a, a site-based work into the lockdown period, yeah, um, your one thing that's been very clear in this is your attention to detail and retention of presence within the work. So I wanted to ask you about the process of that shift. It must have been quite an interesting point in time. You mentioned that you'd um, literally transferred into these your own home sites, yeah, and that you'd got together lots of materials like get green screens and cameras, etc., and got yourself set up. So you'd done a convergence of technologies which would enable you to transmit and receive from your homes yeah but actually what what was what were the really key difference what did you learn did you learn any more about each other through this than you've known about each other physically previously <laughs> what is it that you've learned in relationship to your relationships it's a great question i mean i can start off uh, just by saying, you know, when the pandemic first hit, I personally was so discouraged and I thought, well, how can we possibly continue making this work? We had just had a performance at the Art Institute of Chicago on February 14th. Um, and 
weeks later, we were in lockdown and Mark uh, was so optimistic. Uh, and and I so, I'm so grateful for that. And he said, of course, we're going to continue making the work. We're going to, we're going to figure out, we have to, we have to continue making the work. And so we started rehearsing over Zoom right. and starting to understand Zoom as a creative constraint for the work. And what we found was that our work, because it's already dealing in layers of, of different video, of different sorts of VR, AR technologies, was very well suited to be adapted into the Zoom platform. And we were actually in the collapse of space that the flatness of the screen creates. We were able to try out a lot of new things and push the work in, in exciting new directions that I don't think would have been possible otherwise. And I like to describe this work as kaleidoscopic. And we've just seen, the clip we've seen is the beginning. And believe it or not, that is the less layered part of the work. <laughs> Yeah. That's our gentle sort of introduction to the aesthetic of layering. Um, so it becomes more and more layered and chaotic as the work goes on. Uh, but we were able to make discoveries uh, that we wouldn't have been able to make otherwise uh, about that flatness of space, the collapse of space, the layering. Um, and I think, I mean, one thing that I learned in, in working with Mark and Judd virtually as opposed to being in person is... Um, well, like I said, Mark's optimism and perseverance, which has always inspired me, but also, um, it was in a way, I think it was a, a form of self care or, or mutual aid where we could, we came to realize that we needed to continue. We needed each other and we needed the space of the work in order to get through the pandemic itself. So in a way it really saved all of us, I think. So maybe mark i just wanted to um check with you having these incredible layers that you've got and which actually uh, uh, abraham you you're right and everybody will get to see this whole work later in the kubrick's <laughs> exhibition so um it does get more and more layered and and incredible um uh, like you mentioned a kind of portals through to each other back and forward through different different layers different entrances and exits how tightly choreographed has this work been in terms of what I would call navigation and orientation between the physical and the virtual space? It's a great <clears throat> it's a great question. I mean, first of all, again, in the Zoom platform, we worked with we've worked with a couple of sort of video operators behind the scenes to actually allow for again, the screen to be a medium, right? Or the screen to sort of transport us into these three homes, you know, two in Chicago, one in Cleveland. So yeah. rather than it being, I think immediately what we realized is we liked the live in terms of the way that um, people can be in the room with us um, rather than the webinar format. And no, no, sorry, I mean, of course, loving this webinar right now, but, but, um, but just knowing that <laughs> there's more people in the room, you're actually performing as if it were to a live audience. And then with our um, technical uh, people, we've been able to spotlight each of us over the course of, because this work is currently at 33 minutes. So again, navigating, spotlighting the three of us as it's choreographed between either what it, whatever it is that we're doing um, in terms of the physical action or whether it's actually something in regards to the AR material. So again, uh, Jevene built this beautiful AR poem with the word embrasure, uh, which again is working from the textures of mapping and uh, the for actual fort. And then that is then um, built into our virtual background so that then you get this sense of I think maybe we saw that example, right? If I'm actually performing in Judd's home, even though I'm in my home here, uh, but, but within this virtual background that's actually taking place. So again, it's there's a real sense of choreography. Like there's another sequence where um, I am being uh, placed within, inside the, one of the tender houses. Again, virtually layer, and again, the way that LiDAR so beautifully works is that you can actually scan and go inside, like literally the guts of the architectures. So again, and again, you saw, I think there was a slide where you saw Abe 
uh, on his side, where again, he is being, um, his body is collapsing itself inside Trump Tower. So these are very sort of staged, choreographed images. And again, you know, the work over the years in terms of how much it's been about visual choreography, as it were. So again, yes, the, the visual choreography of time, but the visual choreography of how you go between these three bodies, right? And make those very clear um, uh, images that are really very powerful, again, between this, this thing of the fort, the thing of the Bolin domestic house, which again is a layering right of, first of all, placing us inside a house, but then realizing what it is to be within both inside and outside of the fort. Um, I'll stop there, but again. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And actually just to literally move from that, that inside and outside, and uh, maybe Judd, I could ask you about the, the, the piece that I, I've seen more of it, of course, than we saw now, but even with this clip that we saw then, yeah, the the layers of the body on the body and the gestural interfaces that are sometimes um, perfect and sometimes just disjointed and broken up, etc., as happens within these things. How important was that, those layers, in terms of now looking towards the intimacy and how you've actually layered in? How did you work to enable this kind of blending that you've managed, the virtual physical blending? Yeah, <clears throat> I think it, it's something that just happened gradually through different experiments. Um, but, you know, when the last time we performed this piece was February 14th in, in the theatre. And, you know, in that situation, there is a real separation between screens and bodies. But on the other hand, there's a real connection between bodies. So mm -hmm. there was um, a way in which like Abe and I have co-written the text in such a way that our character is a bit blended. And in the physical piece, we're actually leaning on each other a lot of the time. We're actually physically supporting one another as um, through, throughout a lot of the work. Uh, we're actually, we're sort of interconnected. Um, and to bring that, um, to recreate that in the virtual space obviously isn't isn't possible. Um, so what ends up happening is sort of this idea of the the home that we inhabit or the space that is extending our presence um, gets entangled with the other spaces. A lot of the layering is sort of accidental. Um, like we we already had a lot of layering with with the augmented reality stuff that we were doing. Um, and when we started to do um, the green screening, um, that that sort of got amplified so that there are times when it's very disorienting in, in terms of understanding uh, where someone is. And I think there's a conflation that happens. And um, there's also a lot that's lost in the choreography. Um, we, tr we, we basically, there's... Um, the backdrop is continuous across our spaces, so we can move between that to get those variations. Um, but with the with the technique we're using now, moving between the spaces, um, we're only seeing one space at a time. So it's very much like montage and conflation, um, but not simultaneity. Um, still, much more things to be done on the fact. There are these sort of magical moments of layering where I wonder. You know, how did this happen? That's like, um, yeah. it wasn't, it's not really planned. And, and you know, that I think that's one of the things we've, we've learned is just to trust each other through these experiments. I mean, I think Mark and I having this long history, we've always just kind of trusted each other to, to be intuitive. And we don't talk a lot about what we're doing. Um, and to, for Abe to enter into that, I think um, there was also an establishing of trust there where a lot of things um, when we get in a flow and we don't really know what we're doing. Um, and that that's kind of where we want to be between sort of the ideas that we're having and what happens when we explore them. I mean, you know, the, the Abe discovered he could play guitar. He hadn't played in 20 years. He's, he could still play it a little bit. I wrote a song like we put those things together. And then Mark showed us this video of his jacket and the, the lyrics and the music and the imagery where we're synchronizing in a way that was helping me to understand 
the work or, or, or not to understand it, but to um, approach its mystery. And um, those kinds of moments are, are uh, yeah. what have been yeah, powerful about the work. Yeah. No, well, that, that's a um, perfect response, actually, because it, it really is, I think, um, going with the flow at the moment in relationship to this kind of collage montaging that is, you know, huge potential that you're showing us, yeah, within this work um, is is really the way to go, I think. And it's kind of like, um, even though I, I absolutely recognise, Mark, the, um, the depth of this navigation orientation relativity that's happening and probably how many times you had to recheck that and or do it again or let's how do we get to that magic again yeah, that we reached. I think that um, the kind of structured improvisational side of it also is very enchanting. So, well, look, we're going to say thank you to you three for now, but bringing you back later, although I know, Abraham, you have to go and teach, but I yes. ask you for the other two to stay on and come back and talk with me at the end with the other artists that are going to speak. So, and thank we'll go so further much. into this intimacy. Thank you, Abraham, too. Thank you so thank much, you. Yeah. So, now we're going to move on to talk to Valerie. Valerie Wolfgang, um, who actually is Slovenian and um, based in Ljubljana, is in Ljubljana at this moment. So I'm going to hand over to Valerie to tell us about her work and to talk a little about from the perspective of digital intimacy. Hello, Valerie. Hi, good evening, everybody. So I'm currently in Ljubljana, yes, as you told already to our audience. And I'm really glad that we can all meet uh, globally like this in this digital era. Uh, I will share my screen now, so tell me if you can see it. Yeah, is it working? Yeah, we okay, can see perfect. it. So um, at the moment I'm developing a project uh, titled Love Machine. It's actually a project which is um, supposed to happen in the next three years to develop further. Uh, we started developing it together with uh, Giga Paulovic, who is helping me with the technical um, realization and programming behind, uh, like the brain behind the machine. Um, and due to current conditions, the COVID situation, it's a little bit uh, stopped with the development because we had to leave the labs and we couldn't meet physically anymore. But we're continuing. Uh, with virtual meetings and part of it is also shown in the this year's Kiblix festival and now I will briefly guide you through this um, idea behind the project. So um, first of all in this project there is four major things. One of the things I would like to discuss today is the sensory perception well, and then this uh, virtual versus real, digital versus material world and there is the emerging technologies which are part of the project and also the future of the project in which way is it going to develop and what is it going to include in the future. So if I go to the sensory perception of it, um, first of all, I really like to discuss when I talk about this project of this post-COVID period because as we are all aware of, uh, this strange virus which came to this world as an alien, actually, suddenly changed our lives over the night, I would say. I mean, for me, the physical distancing, which is now happening, so-called social distancing, I like to call physical distancing, because basically I feel that socially we are not getting more distance, but we're, we have to physically watch over ourselves and keep the physical distance. So um, these are all the things which I experienced in my life because I'm often working abroad and I'm part of um, artist residency programs all the time. So now many people are experiencing the same thing as I used to experience in my life. And, you know, all these long distance and telepresence moments are happening in our current life. And also part of the project is, uh, for me, it's very important to talk about technological singularity, uh, which is a thing, you know, we all know that the theory behind the technological singularity is that it's a moment in time where technology will suddenly overcome the human brain and start to guide our lives. But I think this border is already blurred a little bit and we became part of the technological singularity 
many years ago, actually. You know, for example, I use my mobile phone all the time for many years now, and it's, it's actually dictating my life in a way. So um, before I started to develop the project behind the love machine, I posed myself a question. And this question is still relevant. And the question is how to replace physical contact or the need for physical proximity to a fellow human being in a period of rising virtual encounters. So um, yeah, this is the major question which I'm posing to myself. And as you can see on the right side of my screen, there is one installation from Vienna uh, from 2018, which I titled, Sorry, I Can't Make It Today. And it's basically, I, I really love the aesthetics of these old televisions and also the whole, uh, you know, I really like this metal, plastic, the materiality of all the things. Uh, I positioned two very old, this you know 90 screens being positioned next to each other and on the both screens there were two hands from two different people trying to touch each other but unfortunately due to the distance in between them they couldn't touch and they were constantly pushing to towards the screen and trying to somehow touch but there was this distance which just couldn't be you know we just couldn't see the touch and for me, this was a very intimate piece because one of the hands was my hand and I couldn't touch the other hand, which was my partner's hand. And I was doing this work on my artist residency. And the title, Sorry I Can't Make It Today, was because, you know, from my personal experience, when I'm working abroad, developing my artistic career, often I have to say to my family or friends that unfortunately I'm in some other continent, in some other country, and I cannot be with them physically. But I always strive to, you know, keep the this distance that it's not a problem between our relationships. So this was already in 2018. And now in this uh, post-COVID period, I think we are all experiencing similar situation. And from this installation forward, I was very much thinking a lot about how much is the physical touch important to keep the relationships if they're in long distance. And I, one time I read the quote, which I also, you can read it here on the screen. I fell in love with the way you touched me without using your hands. And I think this quote is constantly appearing now in my mind and, you know, I'm now researching how much is the actual touch important in the love um, emotion, not just intimate love, but, you know, love between parents, parents and children, friends, and so on. So the hypothesis which I'm researching is, yeah, we need the physical touch to fully experience the feeling of love. And now through the project Love Machine, I'm focusing on what happens when you fall in love, or and during the interaction with people's feelings of love when one of the elements is absent, in this case, physical touch. When our daily social life regularly takes place mainly through virtual meetings and disembodied contacts with other people. So yeah, this is the hypothesis which I'm researching. And also one of the inspirations for the project Love Machine are coming from this very old vintage uh, you know, torture machines. They used to build in, I don't know, 14th century, these torture machines, uh, which, you know, wanted to torture you in order that you reveal some data. But in this case, I'm trying to build with the use of emerging technologies to somehow, you know, focus on the emotion of love, not in a sexual sense, but emotional sense and then manipulate with another person or to use it, you know, um, when we lack the physical touch in order to be connected and to feel love. So in the project, you can see in the middle image, me and Giga Paolovic testing different VR and motion lip sensors of movement. Um, we're uh, using these emerging technologies. So the, at the moment, we're mostly playing with augmented reality. We build uh, DOI kit uh, from the project North Star. I will show you a little 
um, some more images later. Uh, we're using some sensors of movement, lip motion, for example, and we're also focusing a lot on the haptic technology. Uh, so we are building, you know, there's many projects already where you can feel the touch of another person um, through long distance with the use of different vibrations, sensors and other motions, uh, you know, these haptic uh, technologies. So we're using that as well. And at the moment, we're working also on volumetric video. So the idea is that just before the Christmas, uh, Kiblix will post uh, on Instagram a special filter, which the users will be able to use. And I will be in that filter giving a virtual hug to all the audience, and they would be able to hug me virtually. So this is just one of the elements of the project Love Machine happening right now. So here are some images from the project, which we tested already. We are using the project North Star Kit uh, for the augmented reality glasses. And through these glasses, uh, you can see me on the right uh, showing uh, the first prototype. We are interacting with another virtual person and we are trying you know, to establish the connection establish some emotions through interaction with the virtual person. And at this stage, there is only a virtual element present and you can, you know, for example, dance with another person or play interactive game. You know, for example, if you remember from the childhood, this game where you position your hand like this and the other person was tingling your hands and suddenly they hit you and you need to you know, remove your hands quickly, otherwise the virtual person in this case can hit you on the hands. So, you know, we try to play with our brain and the perception of what is virtual, what is physical, to see the reactions of our brains and how much do we actually believe in these virtual worlds and how much, how, how further can we go in the development through just visual elements and then we are adding the haptic technology. So this is the one step. And as I already mentioned, the most important part of the project is the question of materiality versus digitality. I was very much uh, also inspired by the Aristotle when he was writing on the soul in uh, his book, The Anima. And he wrote the fundamental difference between touch and taste on the one hand and smell, hearing and sight on the other is in the fact that the first two perceive in direct contact and the other senses through something intermediate, the medium. By perceiving smell, hearing and sight through an intermediate medium, they are actually perceiving something distant that the animal is not yet in direct contact with. So he was writing, you know, what's the difference between the plants, animals, and then the human. And as, as I was reading his text, he was, you know, talking a lot about the touch and taste. How is it important evolution, evolutionarily? Uh, why do we need it? And how much is it important in order to develop, you know, your species further? And then on the other hand, there is this smell, hearing and sights, which could be, you know, they are the most easily reenacted virtually also now nowadays and he also wrote where there is sensory perception there is also pain and pleasure where those two are there is inventably lust so when we are talking about about love we are often also talking about lust and while i was also researching this warriors haptic technology throughout the world there is often just this connection of how to use this technology into you know pornographic kind of way and there's many robots which can give you pleasure but can we reenact the emotion of love this is the you know the cycle i'm constantly returning to so you know i, I try to divide the pleasure the lust and the love and also we need to talk about the pain you know the pain is also can be connected with the emotion of love so these are all these questions which i constantly uh, research in my project. Um, as you are all aware of augmented reality, I will just briefly also mention it here for some audience who is maybe not so much aware of this technology. First of all, what is the motivation to enter these virtual worlds? I was questioning myself a lot uh, about that. You know, there is this thing which 
is missing in the real world. For example, we can see here on the pictures in the bottom. It's really amazing to maybe use it in the city when we walk through, especially now Ljubljana is, as I said when we met earlier, that it's like a ghost town because we have these lockdown elements now and we have the police hour. You know, we need to be indoors, but hopefully in this kind of situations we can we could use the augmented reality um, technology and you know if some shops are closed we could go through the city with mobile phones and we would get information about items inside and we could just purchase them virtually of course this is another way of living and we have to get used to it but i'm sure that the corona the covid situation is now pushing us faster into this kind of state and I think we are adapting quickly. Um, and in my projects, also other projects, not just in the love machine, I'm often talking about appropriation of identity and space because, for example, maybe you heard of many augmented reality projects where people are changing their faces, for example, and I've read there is many studies on how we can, you know, change the face of a partner, face of the partner and, you know, have intimate relationship, the sex with the partner, and we can swipe with different face on the partner. So what is this bringing to our lives? Do we need it? I think we need it. Otherwise, we wouldn't create all of these applications. So, you know, I'm thinking and researching on identity and with the, uh, what I wanted to say with the space is especially now I think um, important to discuss because there is many projects appearing in the city, people and artists and you know many companies are positioning their virtual elements, for example, some important statuses. And then the question is when this is going to be more used who is actually the owner of this virtual space? Because, you know, if there is many statuses positioned in some public space, you know, it can become a cluster of all these layers of virtual elements. And I think in the future we will discuss this topic a lot. So that's why also I think augmented reality is a thematic we need to talk uh, and discuss when we talk about intimacy, relationship, and all of these emerging tech um, thematics. And then I would like to just briefly finish this presentation with the future of the project development love machine. Um, the idea is to create the platform uh, where, when, where we will use the virtual experience, augmented reality, and also uh, I would like to include some elements of artificial intelligence. So we're going into this direction with Giga Pavlovich and some other experts. Uh, we would like to develop more haptic elements, so there's going to happen this long distance touch, I call it. So Valerie, uh, can you tell yes. us more precisely how will you be showing this work for us at Kibblex at the exhibition? That's the future. So maybe yes. you can share that with us now so that we can have a bit of a discussion. That would be really yes. great. Yes, Thank I'm, you. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to mention it. In yeah. the Kibblex, unfortunately, uh, the idea was to put these glasses. You can see I'm wearing them here on the images. Uh, the idea was that the public could use them, but unfortunately now it's not allowed this uh, use. But we're at the moment developing the SAP project, which is titled uh, Insta Love Machine. So this is going to be the app which I mentioned on Instagram. So people could experience uh, my hug and they will try to connect with me through, through this, um, you know, uh, like a Insta filter. So this I call it COVID-19 limited edition. Um, and yeah, the main idea is just to start to open the discussion and concerns in connection with these latest technologies and the topic of uh, this technological singularity, which I discussed. And um, yeah, there is many prototyping and programming happening at the moment, but uh, it's a three year project. We are connecting also with the medicine. Because we would so I'm going to I'm going to draw you in now to talk with me, yeah. Because we've mm -hmm. got we 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 need to be fair on time for everybody, yes. yeah. Yes. 
Um, and I did want 10 minutes and we've gone a long way over that. So I'm going to just oh, ask yeah, you. Yeah. Little, Please, yeah. uh, I could talk about this project many hours. Yeah, so that's perfect. Oh, that cool. you. And actually, I have to say, it's incredibly impressive, the research that you've done into um, this whole area. And actually, really, really amazing that you came through with this idea um, in relationship to the depth of research done from 2018, obviously before as well, yeah, but actually the um, how to replace contact, yeah, yeah and how to actually, the, that was definitely a bit of some kind of weird foresight coming through there because you're spot on with the questions that we're dealing with this year. I also have to say that um, some of the um, phrases that you shared with us then are very touching in themselves. So, um, you know, I really felt it when you said that uh, about how, how could we fall in love without touching, you know, without using your hands and without touch. Because, of course, that is the, the situation that many people are in at this point of time. Yeah. Um, and quite bizarrely, we're in a situation where it's it's nearly universal. Yeah, it's not just, uh, um, oh my goodness, those poor people have had terrible floods and famine and we really look from afar and observe. It really is universal, as is the dealing with love and death in this, and you mentioned pain, yeah, as part of love, yeah, which is really important. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So actually, just in terms of your really extending, and I agree with you, social distancing is not the right phrase. I absolutely agree with you, physical distancing. And I think quite a few of us tried to shift that at the beginning, but it wasn't happening. So, um, but basically you are dealing with distance, aren't you? And actually, yeah. in, and the two different in English meanings of distance, whether you're distant across space or whether you're distant uh, because we can't hug and we can't love. Yes, yeah, so, um, so now tell me, um, you, you talked a little bit about key, key blicks, and obviously it is limited what you can do, but it sounds like you've got a very good solution. But onwards, how do you, how do you, do you have any ideas of how this might go and shift across into, say, more used by a lot of people, rather than, you know, talking just the art sector, but actually into creative industry sector? What could you see of some of your ideas that might actually have a validity? I don't mean, you know, huge corporate, but a validity mm. in terms of, us as individuals being able to access each other through some of your special inventions, really. Yeah, first of all, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned there is many um, different meanings to distance because when I was developing the project, which I showed you at the beginning, I was also thinking about being distance, you know, in our minds when we're sitting behind the same table in the same space, but we're absent in our minds. So this is another problem, I would say, with yeah. this distance topic, you yeah. know, how to be present in the moment, really present. But yeah, otherwise, I would really like to connect with the industry more in the next years, especially with the medicine sector and the science. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, now we are experiencing this problem with mental health a lot. And it is connecting, of course, with the absence of sensory perception and, you know, we being suddenly locked in our apartments, even though we have the access to Internet. Not all of us, unfortunately, but a lot of us. Um, so, yeah, I hope that the technology will proceed uh, forward and that we will not think of having virtual conversation just in a form of flat screen. You know, I think once we will do a step forward from perceiving the virtual conversation as a conversation behind the computer or the mobile phone, mm -hmm. then I think we could proceed forward. But in order to do that, I think we first start uh, to think how to develop technology in order to, you know, get rid of this flat screen moment. So maybe there is an option of some yeah, I see it in augmented reality in a way, but mm -hmm. it's still a problem with the medium showing us the augmented reality so maybe holograms or something like that is gonna Wonderful. happen in the future thank you. thank you so i'm going to move on now because what i'd like to do would be definitely make sure we've got time to bring everybody back together at the end and hear more from valerie more from mark judd and we've still got um two presentations i'm going to do a short presentation now about my work across the last 30 years in this area and then we have a special input from sly lee and then we will come back together. 
to talk and um and i'm hoping that we're getting some questions will come through from the chat room so anyone out there has got questions please do pop stuff in there and they will be sent through to me don't worry by the um moderation team who are working really hard in the background here thank you all of the tech team and jiva and um tade and everyone else so i'm going to share my content now <coughs> and make sure I get the right thing here. Great. OK, so hopefully. You can see this um, keynote I have here um, and here, I'm going to just show you quite fast um, a series of diagrams and images which come from the work of Shinkansen and Body Data Space, both collectives that have worked across the, the last um, 30 years, exploring various means of actual dealing with representation of the body and our connections to each other, but through um, the digital, digital era, really, starting with that. So, We've been very obsessed as a group that are coming mainly from performing arts and dance backgrounds, actually, with the whole concepts of touch and of the visceral within media and really felt very strongly that the concept of live presence, which we learn strongly about in performing arts and Mark will recognize a lot of the things on this slide and Judd from their training. The essence of liveness, actually how we put are out there in the world, always on, our breath and our heartbeat is always running, going, even when we're asleep, we, we actually are intimate automatically, we catch each other's eyes very hard in this digital um, uh, zoomification era. We've got perception shifts that happen around us from watching each other's body language. 87% of communication happens through non-verbal communication. Our body languages, our faces, our gestures. And that has a massive sensory richness, which of course we're really deeply aware of as humans who bond together and join all the time. Now, in this year, that has disappeared. We've been, uh, this absolute lack has happened in our lives. But Looking at this next slide, and these are slides from the mid 2000s, this is the work the body data space has been doing. It's been to try to keep hold of the body as the most important aspect, the living body's most important aspect of any di digital developments, any developments around us. So here this diagram shows the transmission and reception, the little tiny dots of the hypersensory, which we now can reach to and send out from our bodies. In fact, a large amount of these um, possibilities, proximity, audiovisual, of course, gestural interaction, motion capture, face, eye recognition is happening all around us. We use a lot of it happens on our phones. We touch an app and it opens up for us visually. We talk on our phones and we can actually activate other things around us. But even at airports now, we've got facial and eye recognition and everywhere else, and it harvesting our biometrics like mad. And we are moving very fast towards the areas and there's several very key creative industry and artists um, working with virtual smell and virtual taste and many others with biofeedback, of course, from the Fitbits. So here we send and we receive back to our body data all the time. It's constantly, flowing out from us and back. If we could see it all in the air around us, even in your home, it would be an incredible network around you. Of course, we can turn this off. Yeah, it is possible to turn it off. We don't always turn it off and maybe we should do more. Kind of like Valerie was saying, we get caught into our mobile phones. So, so for Shinkansen and Body Data Space, two collectives that work from 89 to the present, we've been looking really at this kind of, not if this is a linear, but here we are, the human, and the human is the interface and the development of the human in its representation into avatar worlds and into cyborgs and AI and, and robotics. Now, tonight I'm going to talk um, mainly about the avatar world and telepresence, which is an area I've been working with since the early 90s. These are numerous little telepresence experiences that we've done across time in different workshops, in different club nights, reaching out and trying to extend full body deadly presence to actually enable us and particularly looking at the whole thing of the skin as the interaction canvas, 
dancing between two to three different stages, exchanging our body knowledge, creating, sharing ideas and exploring solutions with many different types of lab based initiatives. A lot of it more like live TV, as we're finding out today. The macro micro dealing with the body close up, dealing with the body far away from us, layering the skin upon skin. Actually, incredible project, this skin touch feel. We used material we've made across three or four years and we just layered it in body on body. So here you're seeing a mixture, a bit like Mark and Judd and Abraham's work here of live bodies and layered filming and transmissions from other parts of, um, of the world. And here again, this is me in Lisbon and the eye is coming in from the Gulbenkian Park to me in the theatre in Lisbon. So, and we looked a lot at virtual touch, at trying to navigate our relativity to each other at a distance across this time and space divide and trying to enable a more intuitive sense of being with our with our screens, through these screens that we have to work on, um, but with our screens to try and find a way to actually feel that exchange, to develop a, a virtual intimacy, which actually would never be the same as liveness, but which at least would enable us to work with colleagues far away, dance sector, dance performance, you always work in groups, you're always collaborating, and to actually be able to be together. And we did this with avatars too. This is our avatar, Orla Ray. We made her, she's part of the collective. She comes out and dances um, with us or um, is in installation setups and actually is an active relativity for us as bodies. And in 2012, we managed to create a connected virtual world between London, Paris, Brussels and Istanbul, where you could actually be an avatar real time in that space with each other in four different countries. And you move through that world with a ripple for your heartbeat, with different colour bodies around you. And we, we gave people the instruction to meet underneath the moon um, in this huge virtual sim hanging between these four countries and to actually hug each other. Of course, you can't hug each other. You go straight through each other's avatars, but the, the aim towards intimacy and the navigation that each individual did with their avatar, this is using Connect, it's using um, telepresence, virtual sim, and gestural interaction. Um, uh, we did our end was at the National Theatre in London. And actually, just quickly to say, we've also been working quite extensively into creative industries with this work. And, um, and this is actually an art piece, but called The Blind Robot, looking at intimacy with robotics too. And this is The ro Blind Robot Touched Your Face. And this was incredibly popular with Keebler. We did this too. It was actually in Maribor first, I think. The premiere was in Maribor. We co-created it with, uh, co-commissioned it with Keebler. Louis-Philippe de Mer and his blind robot looking at the touch of a robot on the human skin. So, so of course, the key word that is everywhere today is immersion. And I think probably overused, but actually does lead us into the creative industry sector and actually what has been mentioned by Valerie, by others around this whole area of the convergence of future technologies which allow us in our singular to meet the group and to collaboratively share together. So future collective co-creation spaces where our data selves are tethered to our physical selves, where we are alive, we are connected, we're collective, but we're not caught up in too many wires and wearables. And we're trying here to go beyond the screen, to use our eyes and our ears, yes, to use our hands, yes, but to use our full bodies and our gestures and our biometric and biosignals, um, which can join us in these creative spaces. And today I see out there working in creative industries, many companies who are working with the, these, these different technologies in the middle here, but actually with the convergence of these. And I think we've seen that tonight as well with Valerie's work and with Mark and Judd and Abraham, bringing together very fast convergences of technologies which can allow them to create liveness in its virtual sense at a distance and across time. Um, and just quickly to show you the most recent big work we did, which was a few years ago and has been touring a bit, but which is not at the moment, is called Collective Reality. And this piece rely, relies on people coming together, experiencing togetherness. The piece actually is a huge sensory environment of visuals and um, sound, but nothing happens unless we move and play together within that piece. It is set off by what 
we call motion is motion capture, but it's looking for us to work together, to hug, to be in groups and to dance together. And the more we do, the more dynamic that living space becomes. This piece was entirely based on hugging, and it does feel quite sad today, actually, that we can't do this piece, and that actually because there was some very special reactions within this space where people were coming together. But we will get back there, and we will hopefully be able to break through these problems and meet each other again in this real sense of liveness. But here, like Valerie, we've been looking towards uh, more positive, what we call the Internet of Bodies, an Internet of Bodies between us, where the body's the centre, the body's the interface, not the tech and the hardware, where the priority is actually where the body is placed, and a collective embodiment, which actually can start to enable positive emotions, where we can participate across real-time physical spaces, connecting groups across time and distance. So that's the work of body data space and actually maybe with this image, which um, is one of our visceral images to actually realise how much we do all miss touch and how much we do all miss this ability to just throw our arms around each other when you meet a friend, to hug, to shake hands even, is very special. And uh, we will get back there. And I'm now going to un unshare my slides and actually take us to our final presentation, which will be with Sly Lee. So Sly, um, can I invite you to come forward and to um, show your work? Um, just to say to you, Sly and I have been working together um, the last few months. We, funny enough, found each other on LinkedIn. And then just a couple of months later, we got put together by a curator to speak together at a conference called Transformational Tech, which usually is a live big conference, I think, of people coming together in LA, but they went immediately online into a very brilliant platform. And we did a, a, a presentation around digital intimacy there and showing our work alongside each other and talking. But I'm going to hand over to Sly now because Sly's got a very, very special set of work to show you, um, which is emerging, yes, both from, you know, university and practices research sector originally, but is now going into production and is in the creative industry sector now in the, in America. So Sly, please do share with us. Thanks, Gilan, and, and happy to be here with you again um, here virtually. So yeah. let me just share a little bit what we've been doing. Let's see, popping up here. Give me one second. It was pretty cool to hear um, everyone's lead up to this talking about touch because it is so important and critical in the world, but also just coincidentally what, what we've been doing the last few years. So here we go now. How is this looking, Gilan? Yes, that looks good. That's good. Very good. Yeah. All right. So I co-founded a company called Emerge with, with uh, Isaac Castro, Mauricio Turan, one from Spain, one from Ecuador. And I'm from the US as a first generation American about five years ago. And as you can already see from our, our origin story as, as co-founders, we understand distance inherently. It's, it's sort of in our DNA. It's how we grew up just being apart from people that we really, really cared about. And that is precisely the origin of, of what kind of company we wanted to create. We wanted to bring to market different products that would sort of redefine what it means to communicate um, when you're not with somebody. And when we looked at the history of, of how we communicated, you know, for the past few hundred years, each time we improved our communication technology, it sort of redefined what it meant to be present information that we could transfer, you know, speed of society, speed of innovation. And at the core of it, what we really cared about was the emotional connection. So we really felt that each step along the way was another big leap in how we can express our emotions because we already have such a hard time expressing our own emotions today as humans. That's why, you know, emojis were invented as a you know surface level attempt to express how we're feeling. And we've we have even harder time communicating that emotion across to someone else, even in person. And so the vision for Emerge was to build um, first and foremost the a product that we thought could solve a lot of uh, problems was incorporating the sense of touch. And I love uh, Valerie, your presentation and, and quotes from Aristotle and really understanding and, and coming to try to answer that question, can we replace physical contact when you're not with someone? Can we replace that need or that urge, that longing for physical contact? 
that is a really hard question. And, and fundamentally, I, I think that answer is no, we can't replace it because it is, it is so baked into even our biology and how we are such a communal species. And so the vision for um, our first product was to create this new platform to incorporate this really critical sense of touch. So in its most pure and simple form, can we create the virtual high five? Can we create a virtual hug? And this concept is not new at all. I think it's been around for maybe 50 years or longer. So we're not new, you know, we're not pioneers to that in that respect. But what I will say is that we are new. What is new about how we're approaching this is the form factor of delivering that experience. So I hope this, hope this shows well here. Microsoft Teams might shut down. So how we're able to, to deliver the sense of touch is through a non-wearable sensation or experience. So I think I'll probably just skip that video. So we have this device, actually, one right here in front of me. So this device we've created is sort of like a speaker. Um, it uses sound energy to create the sense of touch midair at very high precision. So it, it's similar to the ways where pre-COVID you might have gone to a concert and you stood front row and you might feel the speaker energy you know, blasting your chest and you could feel that pulse. Well, sound has mechanical wave properties. So we've really just leveraged that. We've leveraged a lot of the prior art that's been in universities for the last 20 years, built our own technology, built our own IP and core algorithms to make this work in a multi-user real-time interaction, specifically integrated to AR, VR holograms, because we think that the context is really important. And even though I am a scientist by trade, I, I really don't like the word haptics because it is so limiting because of the connotation that haptics has in people's current experience of really simple, you know, touch or vibrations with the phone or being, or, or these really big bulky suits and gloves trying to replicate reality. And I think that's what also separates us from a lot of other people you know, since we are in the in the in uh, stripping a product, now, our competitors, if you will, are trying are really obsessed with trying to recreate reality. So recreating hardness of things is really the goal. But we never really understood that perspective. I'm not so interested in feeling what a rock feels like or a sword feels like in VR or even a keyboard. We're more interested in what does a new language of touch look like. This is a chance to redefine how we communicate with one another. How we can even redefine communicating emotions to other people, even our basic UX UI tools. Why would we bring the keyboard into this future space? So what we really focus on is building the best experience to allow for what you see on the screen here, this to work. So the moment you see a virtual object, maybe through an AR VR headset, you reach out. That's everyone's first instinct is to reach out and physically feel it. Our system is talking to the headset to and enabling the tactile hologram to pair with the visual uh, um, aspect. And the, the core of it is, like I mentioned uh, earlier in terms of the vision, is to have a real-time two-way communication. So we can do this now, um, and we're pretty excited about all the work our team's been doing for the last few years. And um, when Gilan and I spoke uh, recently, it was cool to show how far just the industry in general has come. And we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here, building on all the work, research, and insights people have had for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And it was pretty cool also to see, you know, Keyland's work here in connecting people across the world and now us at Emerge bringing in quite literally that sense of touch. And I do want to, you know, set expectations whenever all of you hopefully get to try it sometime soon or sometime in the future, whenever we are able to launch our product. The expectation that you should have is this does not feel like a real object. This does not feel like a real hand. It's not going to feel like the exact texture of someone that you're talking to. And that's OK. And that's the big realization that we came to. The human mind has an amazing ability to, to fill in the gaps. And what we've done is built an experience that leverages sight, sound, and the slightest sensation of touch in the right context can make you believe that you're actually connecting with someone that you're not. And you're not in the same room, but you feel that you're bonding with them. And that, at the end of the day, is the goal. Our goal is not to create the best you know, haptic experience. It's to create the best bonding experience because we think this is a really big problem in the world. Uh, five years ago, we thought it was a really big problem. And now with, with COVID and, and sheltering at home policies, this is a really big issue people face. And so the core of it is how do you enable someone to transcend distance and time as the theme of this conference has been. We think touch can go a long way at delivering that, but with the core 
end goal being the emotional bonding. And so I'll, I'll stop there and um, pass it back to you, Gilan, and, and happy to take any questions. Oh, you're, you're still on mute. There we are. So thank you. That was just really beautiful watching that bit of video again. Um, and of course, um, I haven't had a chance to do it because, of course, we've been working at a distance as well these last few months. But I do look forward to a chance to actually be able to, <coughs> as you say, feel this new sense and sensation of touch as it comes together. So. So you've been working, the three of you, and I really like it that your backgrounds, you know, your background um, histories have actually fed directly into the creation of this product. The fact that two of you from, you know, got family far away and even for yourself, generationally, mm -hmm. the mix in America and um, and your family as well. So so the understanding of what in some cultures has actually in some languages has got, you know, that a special word, that kind of longing, longing or yearning for others at a distance yeah i think um uh, portugal portuguese um use a very i think it's soda that beautiful song series they have which is just about you know my love across the seas and a lot of folk songs and stuff have it at the base mm. so that kind of yearning side so so in terms of your um work which is um based in the creative industries and and right in the middle of that area of America that we know is thriving with it and buzzing and lots of people on it. Tell us about the reactions that you've had to to this product, this this hardware mm. software product in terms of um, the, the kind of tech companies around you. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually, on that on that note, so the company is based in Los Angeles and we started the company in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley, but we just intuitively intuitively felt that it was too homo too homogenous in the Bay Area and we really wanted to get out because everyone is talks the same, dresses the same, is from the same background, um, from the same talents. And we just intuitively felt that LA was much stronger in terms of diversity, would become another tech hub as well, and that we could leverage the creativity and the arts that the city provides and, and so many creatives, you know, in their work. And so that first and foremost, I think, set up the culture of, of, of Emerge and what we're building and how we bring in diverse thoughts and diverse perspectives and why I'm even here talking in this conference now with, with, with um, all of these wonderful artists. And the reactions that we've received are, are quite interesting. So they're not, they're not exactly what I would have expected. We've, we've gotten people, I think because this is such an, uh, a new interaction, but not a new concept, people sort of go through these very predictable stages. At first they think um, totally makes sense, or they think this is really weird. So it's one of the two camps, which is a great place to be, I think. And then once they try it, once again, either this is phenomenal or this is really strange. But most technologies become really strange before they reach mass adoption anyway, if you think about even things like the video camera or taking pictures and capturing, you know, an image of someone thinking that it was back in the day, people thinking it would stole your soul or something. Um, but the people that we're really focused on and really interested in is um, the emotional people that have the very strong emotional reaction. So we have a few demos where you are able to, like I showed in the presentation, able to communicate with someone that's not in the same room as you. So we have multiple units. We have a big office and we have multiple units set across the office. So we've done things like stuck one person in one room, another person in another room, or even in another city. So we've connected San Jose to LA actually, and sort of repeated the same trajectory of when the first email was sent from, from I think it was Stanford to, to UCLA. We did that same kind of um, reconnection to see could a virtual um, message through touch be sent across that long of a distance. And when we did it, it was it was surprisingly emotional, even though it does not, like I mentioned, does not feel like a real hand, does not feel like real object. The fact that you know you're communicating with someone else through touch, it's such a novel concept. And the fact that you can change their physical space is so new um, that it is quite emotional. And we've specifically tested this with um, couples, with parents and ch children. Those are really interesting um, demos that I've been to witness because um, people that have a very strong emotional bond, when they're able to incorporate the new sense, they don't want to stop. So, so they, they don't want to leave the demo. We have to like say like, we have to take this off of you now. And so I think we've been fortunate to hit upon 
a nerve in society that has seen per, perhaps been seen as taboo before. The ability to connect with someone through touch was seen before the pandemic is why would you even need that? Because, you know, yeah. the, why not just do gaming? Why not just do, you know, whatever? And so I think we've been fortunate to understand that or, or come in at a time where people's behaviors are changing. People are starting to adopt new types of technologies. My grandma uses Zoom now. And so people are experimenting with different types of communication technologies. Now this is not so crazy of an idea to adopt into someone's everyday behavior. The challenge that we face now next year is how do we start to package this in a way to where it's easily digestible because people have a hard time historically adapting to a new behavior. So what we're doing is trying to find ways to help people are already using social communication technologies and just embedding ourselves there to add just a little bit more layer of uh, engagement. Now that's that's really interesting because what we're talking about there is that whole uncanny valley really aren't we and mm -hmm. how you know, the uncanny valley where we're really not quite sure about that that quite strange tech that's coming in it, um, a bit like when I showed the picture of the blind robot for us that project mm -hmm. was an uncanny valley project because um, what would happen and Keebler did it like this too you'd there's some one person could sit in front and the robot would touch the face but all the friends would stand around just going, whoa, whoa, you know, and some of them would never sit down. They, you know, even if they were offered the seat, they would, they weren't going to let the robot mm -hmm. touch them. Now that was, whoa, we're talking about seven years ago or so or more now. And I think we're past that, more that touch point. I remember mm -hmm. also for our work with Telepresence, which was, you know, pretty tough in the 90s, you can imagine. And was, you know, we had a lot mm -hmm. of lag and we were dealing with loads. Nobody really understood what we were doing. But in 2003, when Skype came in, it suddenly went to that um, a mass understanding. And we had people, you know, ringing up and saying, oh, we understand what you're doing now. Yeah. No, can we book you to do this and this? You know, <laughs> so, so it's actually how do things shift into, you know, these mass uses? Um, we've also um, touched on Connect tonight and um, Connect was a very interesting um, output in 2010 which we loved and actually instantly got taken up by the art sector and creative sector. It suddenly was in literally every installation, everything that was around, every everything I saw, but really did enable us to actually bring what was very complex motion capture previous to that with huge frames, well still is in big business, you know, huge framework, uh, multi-camera setups and and then often with massive gear on you, tethering you to the ground so you couldn't really mm. do. And suddenly there was Connect in people's living rooms, all because of gaming. Yeah. And actually, suddenly people could see themselves on screen as an avatar. And they understood what it meant that when I do this, an avatar, my avatar will do it. And it, actually, everybody got it. Yeah. It got understood mm. that transference of the physical to the virtual avatar. So, so I think you're really right that actually um, your, um, your special emerge product. It, I'm sure that, you know, for those people that feel it's strange now, um, uh, will not in the, in the future yet. Yeah? As as, and this year is actually, in a way, put a fast forward on a lot of, you know, all the work we've seen tonight has been put into fast forward by what's happened this year, of course. So um, even the phrase virtual presence suddenly is everywhere, whereas two years ago, mm -hmm. it was practically impossible to for people to understand that. Yes. Yeah? So and the, even the gaming industry weren't discussing presence fully until two or three years ago. So, mm -hmm. right, well, Sly, I'm going to bring everybody back together because we've got some questions coming Let's in on the chat. Yeah, and um, and I'd like to bring in Valerie and um, Judd and Mark again. Fantastic. There we are. We're all merged in together again. Hey, hello, everyone. So I've been getting questions and I'm afraid they're coming through to me on my phone, which is a very strange thing for me as a chair. I'm doing a lot of these hostings. But that, so please excuse me because I'm having to look at my mobile. I'm saying that to everyone in the group, but also to the audience. So, um, so I'm going to go straight into some of these great questions coming in, and we can go further um, depending what we what we what we like to discuss around it. But definitely um, hold into our theme of digital intimacy and virtual worlds now. But also, I'm really happy if you talk further into future, some of the concepts that you think might be buzzing around, as Valerie touched on, as Sly and I were touching on, we can go into that too. So, so Mark and Judd, 
could you both talk about the curatorial aspects of the project, the current project? Um, and what this, um, this um, question is coming from the point of view of the idea of pulling in multiple historical, socio-economical and personal nos nostalgic sources into your work, yeah? And how you place them in constellation to, with one to be other. Um, and dealing with all of the different audience um, uh, interpretations and of, of your ideas, which is very much part of performance and, uh, and the performance, real time performance on the spot, yeah, which you are very used to. But and do you think that in a time where physical exhibition spaces are unused, performance can function as this kind of exhibition making? Wow. <laughs> There's quite a few other questions here. So you've got like you, one of you can answer that one and then I'll come back to you on another one. <laughs> Go ahead, Jen. Um, sorry, can you summarize again a little bit? The, yeah. the voice was breaking up to me it's on the very first long. Part, it's so. a very long question. Can I ask <laughs> oh, there was the layering of all the different Here we are, let's get of, this. Of research Could you talk and... about the curatorial aspects of your current project and the way that you bring together all these different layers of art history, socioeconomic, personal nostalgia, yeah? yeah. And do you think this is a time when performances like yours could actually function as a kind of exhibition making? Are we in that point of time? I, yeah, I mean, I, I think our performance is always sort of exhibition making, right, in terms of how, and you know, one of the lovely things about all these inspiring talks is thinking about how strong the visual bias is in our work and, and how much work we have to do on the, on the other senses. Um, but in terms of the layering of information that we're distributing and the complexity of the work, we do get a lot of comments that the, the most common adjective used to describe our work when, when somebody first sees it is the word layered. And it's actually, it's very pertinent to this piece because it's sort of about materially about layers and perceptions yeah. about layers, but um, that's sort of always been the case. And I think, um, you know, on the one hand, yes, the audience completes the piece. And on another hand, we do a lot of work to construct a pattern and to construct a poetic um, logic. So I, I, I think a lot of our um, patterning, to me, it comes out of language and poetics, but it's um, transferred onto, um, you know, the, the augmented visual um, performance. I mean, I, I was really fascinated by this idea of a touch that is different than real touch. So I was just thinking about the poetics of that, of sort of a vocabulary of alien touch. Um, I think we sort of, you know, in our DIY way, maybe are um, creating these these sort of textured vocabularies that you can't quite um, tactily identify, but but we're hoping that it that it adds up. Um, that it adds up for you. I mean, that it adds up in ways that we intend, but also that it adds up for you um, in ways that we didn't intend. That's that's always been um, something we've desired from the work. No, I like that very much, what you've just said then, because it's such an important aspect of, of um, real-time performance, which performance is. It's live. It's absolutely happening. And it is so able that's why i'm a performance person because i love the way that it can be interpreted by anyone in in any way they want to link to their own cultural history their own background etc and have meaning in different ways and leave memory in different ways as well so so now mark um i'm going to ask you um another question that's coming actually to people wanted to know a little bit more about the infrastructure that you've had in place in your homes. And I think this is just a really practical question. I know you mentioned it, but could you just tell us a little bit quickly about what you've got? So I know you have that is a real bookcase behind you, isn't it? Yeah. This is really Kylie. <laughs> this is really Kylie. <laughs> 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 the bookcase um, is real, but Mark is not, huh? What about no, yes, right. So, yeah, that's it. That's exactly it, Valerie. <laughs> this is a real. This is what I've used to clean my um, my desk. Uh, okay. yes. But uh, um, uh, so yes, very practically. Um, I, I'm actually immediately a green screen, um, a green screen headpiece, a green screen like layers of, of um, uh, fabric, uh, a green screen curtain, a green screen suit, 
um, in terms of just trying to do those manipulations. Yeah. yeah. Um, LED lighting um, and uh, mm -hmm. what else? They also got a webcam. Um, but again, it's the webcam is actually it's, it's kind of impractical trying to get a better streaming. Mm -hmm. But realizing that this again, I've got to figure out a different way than this. Um, because it wasn't necessarily the best thing to be working with when you're also moving through your flat, through your apartment, as we've created these sort of choreographies. So again, real, you know, utilizing this particular streaming camera on the Apple right now. But just to quickly say that um, through the summer, we were working with um, an organization here called um, Co-Prosperity Space Public Media Institute in Chicago, uh, that we were working with over the, the previous year, and we came to realize that uh, we wanted to, there was some, the conversations around the indigenous, conversations around some of the Black Lives Matter um, felt, of course, here we are as three queer uh, people, um, and that some, somehow we needed to have that further conversation. So we've actually set up a virtual residency working with indigenous uh, artists, working with people of color, working with more queer communities. And sorry, and I say that it's, it's going to answer the question about the, the, the stuff, because part of that residency has been uh, funded by the Warhol Foundation uh, and that we're able to actually now look at OBS, uh, open broadcast systems, look at maybe getting better gear, as it were, so that it's not just, you know, working with what we have in front of right but being able to sort of uh get access to i think we've each artist has been given or we as a collective but each artist has been given two thousand uh, dollars and then being able to or, but in addition having access to better gear um so that again this is something but again on the fly we've done over the past eight months but now realizing this is the thing that's been quite extraordinary for us is knowing that as we did uh, turn our world inside out, that actually people were wanting to hear from us about what we were doing. And again, you know, I reached out to Glenn back in the summer and said, this is what we're doing. We, and then, you know, again, strengthening those communities that we've been fostering over the years, both, you know, immediately, but also 20, 20 plus years of conversation to realize that uh, we can also be built world world building, right, in terms of how we can make these connections and conversations and communities. So again, I'm, I'm really excited that we were able to create this year long virtual residency as a pilot, but it looks like it's probably going to keep keep going post pandemic. Um, so so that's, that's um, uh, a really good example of what I'm really interested in at the moment, and I'm keeping my eye out everywhere is these new types of formats and of, of virtual physical or virtual hybridities, yeah, and that would potentially even, and when we hopefully go back to being able to be together and travel, et cetera, that we don't need to drop those, that we still can stay within that kind of virtual physical space to create more um, connection between us. So it becomes deeper onwards, really. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a good point to make with Mark on screen because I hardly ever see you. And yet we were working <laughs> together very closely for a number of years, you know, when you're in London. So um, so that would be special. So, so um, I've got another question here that's come in. Um, and uh, I'll put it to um, Sly and to Valerie, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna ask you both this. So as the body becomes its own virtual interface, which we've really been talking about, the body is the interface um, in its own right. Do you see, what dangers and perils do you see around that in relationship to the transference of our bodies into this more virtual world side? And this is, you know, generically, not about your work, but in terms of the mm -hmm. generics, yeah. So um, the dangers and perils that someone someone wants to know what you see as those. Yeah, it's a question. Valerie, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, you think when we achieve this moment in time when we cannot distinguish what is real and what is virtual, right? Yeah. If that moment happens and when it happens. Well, I think... There is this metaphor I like to tell sometimes when I'm talking about maybe artificial intelligence and stuff connected with that. 
I somewhere read that, you know, there's this uh, uh, thing uh, where the lion is much more stronger than a human being, but because we have a bigger capacity of our intellect, we, we created a cage in which we put the lion, therefore our intellect won over the muscles. And uh, then my question is what, is, what will happen in the future when we become the lion in case of artificial intelligence so that, you know, the intellect becomes virtual and, you know, it can change, uh, shift the perspective. And also in the case of virtual presence, I think it can happen the same, that uh, the manipulation can become stronger but, you know, this is just the mirroring of our society. I mean, if we are, maybe we are afraid of that because we know we are capable of many manipulative and bad things. But I think in general, we shouldn't be afraid of all new technologies because, I mean, always bad things can happen. But if we are constantly worrying about those things, then we are just maybe stopping ourselves in a way of development. So I don't see any... A lot of bad things because they are happening already with the virtual chat rooms, with the manipulation of especially younger generations, the kids. But mm -hmm. if we put a lot of effort on educating ourselves, also older generations, I think we will be, we will have a smooth transition. And you know, just we need to keep a lot of focus on education and discussions and panels like this. Yeah, no, good. That's a very good point. Yeah. yeah, the more debate we all do, particularly at this point in time, allows us to, well, one, try and demystify this all crazy, what is sometimes very complex stuff, yeah? yeah, and is often fed out to us as complex in a way to control that that mystification, to keep it up, up mm -hmm. on the stake hell, okay. you know. Um, so actually, um, uh, can, I, can, I, can I approach yes, that real quick? Yeah, yeah, time? Sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, um, so yeah, yeah. I think I think I totally agree with Valerie in terms of the, that we shouldn't fear to push on because because otherwise we would still be, you know, rubbing two sticks together trying to make fire, if that's the argument. But I do I do disagree with the whole Silicon Valley's tech utopia view, which I think is changing, which is good. One re another reason we, we, we decided to build in L.A. because um, there's always the potential um, and, and it depends how the technology is designed. And I love the show Black Mirror because I am internally an optimist, but I love dystopia because we should be thinking about this as the creators of the next platforms that we that people will use. I think one of the dangers of, of the blending of physical and virtual is if we forget, if we lose our humanity, and that's very tempting um, because we will have the ability to do very superhuman things. And I think it is part of being human to naturally evolve past our natural capabilities. I mean, we're trying to eliminate disease and cancer that naturally is trying to get rid of something, you know, that it was inherently human. And so I think one of the dangers is um, not drawing that line correctly or maybe skewing too far one way or the other. If we skew far too far too conservatively, the danger would be um, lack of progression. Um, and if we skew too far the other way, we might you know, lose our just, you know, uh, what Valerie's saying, you know, maybe we become the lions in the, in the cage. And um, I think it's especially timely because the rate of acceleration now is very, is much faster than it was before, you know, we moved, I can't remember what it was, I think it was like 100 years from the phone call to the video call. And now from the, the video call tech to the smartphone, it was, it was much faster or just from the phone to the smartphone was extremely fast. And now um, now we're going into XR and, and AR, VR. So I think it's really good. It's my favorite topic, actually, is ethics in, in these technologies, because it's not all good and it's not all bad either. No, that's, that's a very good answer. And I think just from my end, there's one area I won't go into a lot now, but that everybody should definitely um, keep on top of and is one of the dangers is um, we're seeing it at the moment with the um, debate around contact tracing apps. And this is about the mm. the, the actual um, harvesting of our biosignals. So it goes back to a couple of the diagrams I showed of the, um, you know, from facial recognition right through. But we need to be aware that the behavioral economy is based on harvesting our biosignals from 
um, augmented reality, from motion capture, from, you know, gesture tech of all types, from everything on our Fitbits to, you know, walking through airports, like I mentioned. And that is sold for lots of money to other big companies. And that is the key to the predictive economy. I what we what they will believe we need pushed at us in future. So so that's an area I think that um, it is not so directly relevant to Judd and Mark's this particular work, although I know it is in other works you do. Yeah, but um, definitely Valerie in your work and and Judd in your work, you're you're dealing with biosignals. You're dealing with data which is taken from the motion from the body itself. Yeah, so so I'm um, the transformative tech conference actually dealt with this a lot and there's quite a lot on their website about it. But I'm very concerned about personal data ownership. So that's the other danger, I think. So now look, we've got um, we've got about five minutes left and I've got a great question here, which I'd like to maybe allow us all to say something to. Um, and that's about actually how artistic practice um, as we've seen tonight, and there's very creative thinking, can actually maybe more positively affect technological development in its mainstream use. Yeah. How can we enable this to happen more that artistic methods um, actually do and strate strategies actually come back into more mainstream focus without just being appropriated by tech giants as such? So um, I don't know. I mean, Sly, maybe I'll just bring you in there straight up because you obviously have you know, managed to push through this somehow, yeah, uh, uh, some way. I'm sure your feeling has still got a lot further to go, but you're on your way, yeah. That how yes. can we get these more sensitive um, and aesthetical uh, effects into the mainstream from very creative thinkers? Mm. Yeah, that, that is, it's probably the hardest question of any, any startup yeah. is how do you commercialize? <laughs> Yeah. And it, it's it's something we're currently going through. Timing is for sure a huge um, challenge, and now uh, a tail uh, a tailwind in terms of uh, adoption and, and getting this into the mainstream. Um, so I think already in terms of just our specific journey, we've we've been able to lower that barrier in terms of people are willing to adopt new technologies. There is a reality in that there's some really big um, technology giants out there today with you know market caps and that with t's in the trillions as opposed to you know 10 years ago which was just in the billions so that is that is a really big challenge is i look at my friends companies and our partners get just snatched up by all of these large companies and then the the timelines when those products can come to market are now unknown um so I don't know if I have the answer on on how on how we can well, get that's, this more that's helpful information mark i just to ask you because i <clears throat> really appreciate and respect that you're working into um, communities that usually don't have access or the access to all the chance to create with yeah these kind of tools but the, the messaging that you're um helping with yeah the active activism messaging we do need that to reach a wider mass audience so how can you see that happening through the type of work you're doing I mean, just actually, it's a good question because a um, couple of examples. Again, I've been connected to. Um, <clears throat> I've been. I've worked with an elder for a project called um, Artists and Elders. It's basically con connecting ten artists with ten elders. So I worked with uh, this woman, Sarah, who has mobility issues. She hasn't left her apartment since March, and we have basically made a work together. So. Um, and also I've been another project where 10 dance artists were connected to 10 Hubbard Street uh, dance artists. Um, and so that's been a really interesting way of mm -hmm. uh, thinking about developing new communities, I would say, thinking about institutional, just collapsing of maybe institutional in the sense of suddenly I'm being connected to an elder that I would never have known before, right? And making an actual performance for her. Um, based on conversation and dialogue. So again, that sense of intimacy, right? The one-on-one. -on -one. And then that's being broadcast uh, this coming Thursday as a virtual exhibition opening with the work that we did together. And then also, again, this thing of working with the uh, dance artists, which again, Hubbard Street is like this monolith, let's say the uh, dance company here in Chicago. I would never have had access to this company prior to this. 
Um, you know, in terms of, again, of course, I'm, I'm calling myself a choreographer, but again, there's a, you know, these different worlds that uh, begin to merge together. So for me, the artistic is actually opening up um, different kinds of conversations around, and of course, we are, we're doing this through the teleconferencing, but I think there's something to me about opening up new communities that di would not normally be connected are now being connected together and that really excites me i have to say yeah uh, that's really great actually because you've given us an image of how actually on a micro level <clears throat> just the connection of one to one yeah. can be in itself so important and actually the more we make those creative connections between you know the kind of local to local one to one yeah the more that can ripple out and have a really quite strong effect because it's got a grassroots growing up effect yeah. rather than it being placed on everybody to do certain things, you know. So, um, um, actually, would you like to add into there, Valerie, at all? Because you've got a very big mixture in your work of um, obviously your art, you know, your artistic work going out there, but you are working with a lot of tools, you know, and in advanced stages of it, so augmented reality, et cetera. Yeah, I really like, first of all, maybe I would, I often talk about also that we first need to make sure that a lot of people get access to the basics at the beginning, you know, the, as there is still so many people in Slovenia who don't have any access to internet, for example. So it's very difficult for me to use all this contemporary technology. And there is, on the other hand, people who don't even have a computer yet. So first we need to overcome these gaps. Uh, and the secondly, I think that I really agree with Mark when he said that the artists are creating these communities and we are making sure also to communicate the scientific parts of the researchers in this area to the people, because I think through arts, it's much more easier to, you know, to share this very complex scientific researches um, and give them back to the society. So in a way, I think artists are a medium between the science and the general population. So we can then all get the idea in which direction we want to go and the general public. So I think the, you know, the point of art is also in this way to become a medium between the population, general population and the much more advanced scientists, which are also flying now over us in satellites and in space and connecting all these worlds together. Yeah, you're right. So, And Judd, you actually um, have been, I know, uh, a, a real, real pioneer in the area of hypertext and augmented reality, way ahead, way ahead in that field. And um, and I was wondering now how you see, now you can see that some of the things you've been working with for many years actually are coming through into more mainstream use. How do, how do you see this crossover? Judd, you're mute. Judd, so sorry, Judd. I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, I, just to comment on acceleration, that's happening so quickly. I mean, Abraham and I were building these augmented reality tools and as soon as we finish them, they'd be released, you know, there'd be an, an upgrade to, you know, AR kit or whatever. And all of our work was so, I mean, there's there's so much that I was just as you were, as you illustrated in your talk, that is that is coming back around. Um, but I would also say as as like an artist as, who's not as really a scientist or an inventor, but who is a teacher, like I think that um, what we model as artists is like experimental engagement that is non-consumer based. And that's one thing that we model is like, how do I use this technology in a way that it is not intended to be used? Um, so when we did our, our LIDAR scans and we're using this powerful cutting edge technology to swallow up these whole landscapes, the thing that I got completely transfixed by was the hole that was left under the scanner where it can't see itself. And so much of the poetics and aesthetics of our work are about that that absence, that thing that's a defect or that thing that um, is a limitation of the tool becomes the, the powerful sort of, um, you know, portaling uh, un yeah. symbol of the unknown within our work, that data void of what, what can't be known, what can't be captured. So there's that experimental engagement. I, I had to go back to Internet art in the 90s. It's like you exhaust 
the platform. You don't use it the way you're supposed to. You exhaust it as a material mm -hmm. when you're when you're more like a DIY sensibility. The other is is to have a critical engagement. Who has access to the tools? The the thing with this piece that we really came up against and are up against now is in our research, there are stories we can't tell from our from our positions uh, as we happen to be white, cis, non-native to the land we live on these things. How can we um, leave room for those for those stories to be told by others? Um, but but more problematically, there are stories that our algorithms can't tell, uh, and there are biases. There there are um, racist biases and algorithms. And so the more that we think about critical engagement and access, the more the tools have to just like they did with film. When, you know, when film became mainstream, that they have to grapple with the biases behind their engineering. Yes, yeah, no, that's a very good point. Thank you. Well, um, sadly, we're going to have to wrap up and I know we could carry on talking, but I've got <laughs> loads more I'd like to talk to you about. And I have I haven't even managed to get through all the questions, actually. So apologies. I tried to weave a couple into each other. To, so apologies if I didn't quite get to any of your points, all of you who are out there in the audience. So um, I, I think this year has been exceptional, uh, obviously, a situation a slightly like some kind of um, horrendous universal research group for this kind of work, you know, the digital intimacy area. Yeah, it's like everybody kicked up the bum straight into this virtual presence, whether you like it or not. Yeah, whatever age you are, wherever you are in the world. And um, that has been a very, very difficult for many people. And on top of that, people are dealing with death. And death obviously has its very important rituals, very important liveness part of it when coming together and actually dealing with grieving and bereavement is incredibly important body crossover. Yeah. And actually, in some cultures, obviously, the laying out of the body, the cleansing of the body, all those rituals, too, which have been denied. Yeah. So we have seen an, you know, an amazing shift of very day-to-day -day people into dealing with very complex things like virtual funerals, um, virtual um, uh, ceremonies, rituals, etc., which they would normally do all together in one place physically. And people have had to intensely learn skills to actually get this to happen. You know, on the spot, people have been streaming from their different places and trying to enable different people all over the world to join in, which it has enabled some more remote connectivity there too. So what I do think that today's shown is that with um, the kind of work we're seeing here and we will see onwards in the Kablix Festival, <clears throat> the virtual worlds that are coming through now today and the tools that are enabling them from these different works, these are leading us towards a kind of metaverses, which actually will allow us to exist in, in, in both the virtual and the physical, and potentially to exist with our body data, particularly if we can own our own body data, which would be wonderful, in those metaverses, both as an avatar and as our physical selves. And there, hopefully, to be able to meet, greet, and to be able to be there and leave our traces for the future too. So. I think one key thing that Valerie said that we need to emphasize is actually the issues there are for people who access. access and digital access being not just, you know, being on broadband and on uh, and being um, having a computer, but actually access, as Mark and Judd are talking about, to the uh, the um, the skills and the rights to be creative within with these tools, too. And um, there's me and Valerie here today. Um, um, that's two women working on it, but we still need a lot more women actually in this scene, you know, from many different cultural backgrounds, all different backgrounds. It's still highly dominated by, um, and as Judge and Mark have been so honest, white men, yeah, very definitely, but men in general. And we are 52% of the world, so we've got to make that space for the content creators to come through from not just women, but, you know, 52% of the world, but from all types of diverse types of people. And as Judd very rightly mentioned, the biases in algorithms have got to be dealt with, etc. But until we've got space for these immersive new experiences, which are where we're 
representing ourselves and we're meeting others and we're dealing with identity, new sense of identity within these worlds, yeah, and how we deal with these complex layers of the multi-cells until we make space for all types of content and creativity from very diverse range of people, we are going to continue to go a bit in a circle. So if you're out there and you've got space to give people, either with tech or with access to tech or creative time or whatever, do try to think about the, the people who have less advantage in getting hold of this because we just need the mix of content. We need this debate to come from many people right the way through. So thank you all very much for sharing with us so honestly. Um, we really appreciated it and we will look forward to seeing um, Valerie's work and Mark Judd and um, Abraham's work in um, the Keeblix exhibition with lots of other pieces coming up. And Sly and I will be back around for sure, having a look around them all <laughs> from the virtual distance. Um, and we will, we're, we're on Twitter, there's lots of connections to us which are all on the Kiblix website. Do keep in touch and do come and catch up with us at other events, etc. too. So um, I'm going to hold on to my panel here, but I'm going to say good night to everybody else and thank you, all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Elaine. Good night. Thank you, Gilan. Thank you to all of our guest speakers who were with us today for sharing your creative ideas, concepts and outputs in the field of digital intimacy. Here, I would also like to thank to our audience who were with us today and I would like to invite you for our next live stream of our next panel discussion, which will be next Thursday, December 10th, starting at 6 uh, p.m. The panel will discuss topics such as XR, technologies, industry, virtualization of everyday life, with a special emphasis of COVID-19 global condition. Thank you, take care, and good night. <laughs>